deep in the ESPN tape library. The worldwide leader in classic sports launched a series designed to take a new look at old games. They called it Cheap Seats with Ron Parker. Parker, an anchor with attitude, was held thanklessly by tape librarians Randy and Jason. The show was slated to go all the way. But moments into the first show, tragedy struck. With Ron on the DL, somebody needed to step up, like Gehrig for Pip or Brady for Bledsoe. Sitting two and three on the hosting depth chart, that someone was Randy and Jason. That is their story. And this is Cheap Seats without Ron Parker. Hey, welcome to Cheap Seats. I'm Jason. This is Randy. And today, we're going to be showing you logs rolling and checks bouncing. And no, it's not an episode of the Dukes of Hazard. It's our Wide World Backwoods edition of Cheap Seats. And it's one rugged half hour of the kind of redneck goodness that makes you want to go out and buy several yards of flypaper just for the heck of it. We start with the lumberjack competition in Hayward, Wisconsin, which speaks for its redneck self. Then it's on to guys playing soccer on bikes, which sounds like a game you play in a Walmart parking lot while your uncle is inside shopping for artwork and boxer shorts. So with that, we invite those with a valid ID to put down that restraining order, crack open a tin of Skull Bandits, sit back and enjoy our wonderful low-rent version of the redneck games. It's like the show Cops with shirts. Saw, then chop, and the first you want a birdhouse? I'll give you a frickin' birdhouse. And three weeks later, Sammy Sosa had a brand new cork filled back. From here to I hate totem poles. You'll see them under the blue skies of Wisconsin. With a big crowd. No, Ray, that's the cesspool. Ah, it's not gonna make them any dirtier. If I see you with my wife again, so help me God, I'll chop your... Oh, it's just a lot. He's got his foot on the neck of the giving tree. That's so uncool. Country cleared by woodsmen. Top strong men with energy to burn. And not a woman in sight. to do with it. Except sit around with an old hound dog in the evenings and brag about who was the greatest lumberjack of them all. It was inevitable that one man would dare another to prove his boast, and in 1898, they held the first World Log Rolling Championships. It Where? Niagara Falls? Tom was the greatest of them all. And in 1960, the Lumber Are we there yet? Are we there yet? Don't make me get my axe. Population 1457. Once in Hayward, they added other events, like tree topping, sawing, and chopping. And cruising the strip for working girls. <laughs> The double hey, stir. Well, you go, Saturday girl. Afternoon, you can go downtown and watch them make fudge. See, kids, fudge can be fun. Hey, we're to vacation town, really, these days. A vacation hey, from what? To be a lumber Prison. Town. They come up here from the big cities, from Chicago, and Detroit, and Milwaukee. Come here to sample the cheese and look at the world's largest mounted muskie. That fella is. If you clap in front of his mouth, he'll sing. Don't worry, be happy. Once a year, you can go down to Tony Wise's History Land and watch the Namakogan Queen come in to officially open the World Lumberjack. Whatever happened to Boy George? Please let this thing hit an iceberg. Please. Good afternoon. I'm Jim McKay speaking to you from Hayward, Wisconsin. And you know, a full decade in all of our lives has gone by since the first time we came here for the Lumberjack Championships. But a decade has passed since they've been there? The Clearly they weren't in a rush to get back. It really hasn't changed that much. Neither has the sport. You know, basically there are two kinds of sports in the world. There are the contrived games, like football, basketball, baseball, things like that. And then there are kind of the basic sports, like, well, let's say track and field. Who can run the fastest? Oh, yeah, track and field isn't contrived. People pole vault in the wild all the time. The river, she's too deep. I'm going to have to triple jump over her. The events are simple in that sense. Who can... Ow, ow, splinters in my palms. Ow, ow. Who can saw the fastest? Chop the fastest. Who can spin another awful... Whoa, that dude's good. ...more quickly than all the rest. It's a very interesting nope, and that's a lumberjack one. And it looks like someone just entered her first wet t-shirt contest. The music of the forest was provided by the bucking saw. And that's an event here. Try to put this seven-foot bucking Boing. saw, one man, Boing. all the way to this 20-inch log as fast as you can. The world record, and almost unbelievable, 24 and one-tenth second. You know, I don't if believe you. I tried this, I swear it would have to take us about a half an hour or something to go through this. Speak for yourself, McKay. I've been working out. Suddenly the teeth on these big saws probably look as if they're cut in a very random way, like a badly arranged set of human teeth. That's, That's why it's called a British saw. It's very scientifically done. Let's take a look at them. For example, 
these two teeth here on each given set of teeth what the hell is this? this Wood way. chopping 101? Easy. Yeah, we better be getting college credit for watching this. And as for this big fella here, well, that's really kind of a broom. It cleans out the sawdust when you're going in both directions. And this little girl here will eat all the sawdust once it's collected. Right now, we're ready for the finals in the one-man bucking. It's going to be John Miller against Ed Rosemeyer. John Miller is the world record holder in the event. He's on the left. He set that record of 24 and 110 seconds, but this is... Wow, he came a long way to get there. Well, we know who Roseburg, Oregon's written for. Same town out in Oregon. There's Miller with his back to you. Or do we? Wow, what are the odds? Okay, here they go. Is that his wife oiling the saw? That is a domestic dispute waiting to happen. Each man has a pit crew, you might call him. Applying oil to the saw to keep it lubricated so the log doesn't... Honey, don't put the oil on the log. Well, where would you like it? On the saw, like we practice. God! Really impossible to say who's ahead. Must be elderly couple. Really gotta be close. Here they come. Come on, faster, honey. Oil it faster. I'm trying. <laughs> Way to go. Could you have oiled it any slower? Nice, he smoked an old dude. Over the world record holder, John Miller. They're Thank you for helping me win. No problem. Oregon. Well, I'm out of here. And by here, I mean this marriage. The winner, the time 30 and one tenth. That's well off the world mark. Now, who's going to saw those sideburns? Now, as you might imagine, some pretty solid battle lines were drawn in Roseburg, Oregon that day. And it soon became a town divided, chopped in half by hate and loyalty. These people had an axe to grind with themselves. And that's why Roseburg, Oregon is the subject of our cheap profile of the week. White Sox and Cubs, Lakers and Clippers. When a town shares two teams, its citizens have to choose sides. And sometimes it gets pretty ugly. But never did it get uglier than here in Roseburg, Oregon, when Roseburgites had to choose between its two native lumberjack sons, Miller and Rosemeyer. My daddy was for Rosemeyer. My granddaddy was for Rosemeyer. The name of the town is Roseburg, Burger the Rose. How can you not be for Rosemeyer? Well, I've heard the Burger Rose argument. Don't make sense. If the town was called Rosemeyerburg, that would make sense. But it ain't. It just ain't. The Millers uh, helped discover Roseburg. They are some of the first people here. They actually built the very first of 17 chocolate factories in town. Before the feud, Roseburg was a virtual paradise. No one knew about us, nobody bothered us, and there was chocolate everywhere. In a rare show of solidarity, Roseburg tried to settle its feud before the World Lumberjack Championships, but the unthinkable happened. It was about two weeks before the competition. We had a debate at the town hall to try to put the whole issue at rest. And then the video popped up. The video in question comes from a surveillance camera located in Ed Rosemeyer's garage, which shows John Miller's younger sister, Lizzie, doctoring Rosemeyer's prize saw. She should have her dirty Miller hands cut off. The two camps once again were torn apart, and Roseburg, Oregon was quickly becoming a town on the verge of destruction. There's a lot of anger in town at that time. Chaos. People were destroying what they loved most about the town. Chocolate. Hate filled the air. I remember waking up and seeing giant flames outside my window. And I turned to my wife and I said, Hey, Dolly and honey, do you think that's the smell of Miller's burning flesh? She said, No. It's just the smell of chocolate burning in the wind. Unemployment in Roseburg quadrupled, and the town has never recovered. It's sad, really, because here we are almost 30 years later, after the lumberjack competition. Those two guys don't even live around here anymore. There's still no jobs, but there's still a debate about it. It's never sad to have pride. Rosemeyer may have left town years ago, but that doesn't mean I will ever stop thinking about his gorgeous body and athletic skill. No, he's a great man. And all the chocolate in there. The... 
Sadly, this socially insignificant oh, you, feud rages on. God, get him! Get him! Get him. That's one of the rumors! That's a dog! Welcome back to Cheap Seats. We are watching another installment of ABC's award-winning Wide World of Sports. What award is that? The Latin Grammys. The first Hayward, Wisconsin Lumberjack competition took place in 1959. Only 35 tickets were sold for the first day's performance. Now, over 12,000 people come every year. Man, we'd kill for that size audience. Yeah, 35 people would be sweet. Mm. Let's get back to the wood. Silhouetted against the blue sky of northern Wisconsin, you're looking at the top of a cedar log. And it's the world's largest stripper poles. We've got John Miller on the main stage. Ed Rosemeyer on the bar. Speed climbing. The object, very simple as all of these events are. Because simple is simply the only thing these simple-minded simpletons understand, right? All right. Now, which one's number one and which one's number two? But mostly, it is this small spike. We will call it m, -m, -m, -m mookie Spike that helps him to scale the pole, and then perhaps even more important, snubs him as he almost free falls to the bottom of it. It's a tremendously exciting event, really. Really? Speed climbing. Right, Jesus? In the final this year, we're going to have Armin Didier against Leslie Stewart. This is Armin Didier. Clint's from brother. From Columbia, Canada. One of the very best in this field, but so is Leslie Stewart, another Canadian. Canadians are very strong in this sport, have been for some years now. Come on, that's the kind of talk that got Jimmy the Greek fired. In the free fall aspect of this, when they're on their way down, it's important to remember that the rules state you can only free fall 15 feet at a time, no more than that. It's a kind of a safety measure. Without the safety part. That's Stewart in the green shirt nearest to you. It's Cable Guy Boot Camp. They said they'd make it up to the top between 2 and 6 p.m. He missed the bell. He missed it again. Stewart's got the lead. But here comes Didier. Look at him come down that pole. Looks like he missed the bell. Two that can't be good for the knees. Cheese heads. And yet, he's still unemployed and single. Missed the bell three times. All right, fast forward. Fast forward. Okay, all right. The place very securely, very tightly, could be dangerous otherwise. And there is Arden Coger of Webster. Well, first we'll suck out the fat from here, then we'll take it in a few inches here, and then we'll increase you a full cup size here. You want those first cuts to go. His opponent. No, dude, you're supposed to draw on the log. New Zealander, now from British Columbia, Canada. By the power of Grayskull. Whew, that tired me out. Talk to Arden here a little bit earlier. Talk to him about the technique of his event. How does this work? What's the technique of this event? Well, pretty much you take the axe and then you hit the log. Duh. First thing, you, it, you, you put two blows up, you see, one on this side right over here and one here and then one here and one there. Talk about being overdressed. You're an axe chopper. Put some freaking jeans on. Yeah, that's the first four cuts. You did two down here? Two down here, one over here. How are they still talking about this? It's simple. Well, that was Arden a couple of minutes ago. Here he is right now, nearest to you, in the red shirt, ready to go against Ryan Hurley. Must Columbia, keep Canada. chopping. Remember, Must silence lambs. For a 14-inch log, that is incredible time. Hurley may be a little bit ahead. I wonder what they're thinking about when they're chopping those logs. Oh, uh, okay. Later, yeah, he's, he's got, got away just a bit. <clears throat> Well, they've already passed that world record time, so it's going to be nowhere near that. Going for the world title of the Lumberjacks in this event. Standing chop. Whoa, dude, that guy fell down as soon as that other log went down. All right, go back, go back. That's a voodoo log. Voodoo log! Arden is the winner. Early he left, lost his balance, and fell down. Man from West Virginia. Who might here, kid, here. catch. Thanks, Mean Joe. Okay, let's go back to that interview with McCann, the lumberjack, who was explaining how to chop a log. That explanation took so long, we couldn't help but show it to you again in a cheap reenactment. Cheap seats, cheap reenactment. So tell me how this thing works. Well, Jim, it's as easy as it is simple. First things first, you got to mark your log. Then you chop it. No. Then you pick up your axe. Then you chop it. No. Then you bring it back real high with a good grit. Then you chop it. No. Then you bring it forward, bring it back, and then two chops at top, two chops at bottom. Then it falls over. No. Then you move around the other side. Two chops at top, two chops at bottom. Then it falls over? Not if you do it. Oh. 
Sean Duffy, a three-time winner of the climbing event at the Lumberjack Championships, was on The Real World in 1997. Do you care that at one point in the show he started a log rolling program for Boston area children? Do you care that he is now a district attorney and seriously considered running for Congress in 2004? No, but I do care that his campaign manager was Eric Neese. Yeah, and that they ran on the dance party ticket. Oh, hey. Uh, do you think? What? Me and people. The classic huh? event of any lumberjack championship is the log. Okay, you don't need to hold the ropes. The logs are tied to the dock. L I N G. The object of it is very simple: to spin your opponent off the log and into the water. What you're looking at right now is a flashback to the first log. Log rolling Brad Hall? And he's up against outdoorsy Frank Zappa. Young Jim Fisher from Stillwater, Minnesota. You go. No, you go. Go. You go. All right, we'll both go. On this red log, they went a total of two minutes. Then they White log rolling in the dead of night. Is four minutes. And they went right through that Wouldn't it be great if some drunk dude on a wave runner just totally bisected that log? <laughs> In fact, they brought them again. As you can see, we're not too far from the forest. Or a garbage can. The festivities here. But here is the action resuming again. Bill Scott on the left, Jimmy Fisher on the right now, wearing the hat. A this Jimmy is the hat. Final fall for the World Log Rolling Championship, an event that is actually supervised by the International Log Rolling Association. Look out, and it's Bill Scott down. Oh, Fisher with the upset. He was the loser. A tremendous upset. Young Jimmy Fisher just out of the service. Have you Young? What service did he return from? The Confederate Army? Here, let me give you a hand there, buddy. Whoa, okay, that's a little too much. Bill Scott, first of all. And the title returns to the United States for the first time in 19 years. USA, USA, USA. Wow, what a win for the Americans. Huge. I guess you could say Uncle Sam's got log rolling in his jeans. So, what, are you saying that log rolling is innate? Because <laughs> I think it's an acquired talent. Well, then you're an idiot. Well, I don't think so. Well, I think I know a couple of guys who can help us settle an even deeper log rolling debate. sticker that says your second car is a tractor and that's the truth <laughs> you might be a log roller if you've ever looked at a taquito and said i can balance on that while it floats on a lake <laughs> you might be a log roller if you ever thought frogger should have been a live action game <laughs> Accidentally ordered flan because you thought it would taste like flannel. <laughs> well, let's switch gears a bit as we move to our second Wide World event of the show. For those of you who love cycling but have always felt there's not enough soccer mixed in, this next event is for you. It's called Cycleball, and it was the best pairing of two unrelated sports until the X Games went ahead and combined bowling with swimming. It's Cycleball from the 1960s in Switzerland, and I can't think of a bigger party. The score is one to nothing in favor of West Germany. West Germany in the white shirts with the dark stripes. Are they in someone's basement? Yeah, this is like a game you invent when you're babysitting. Goaltender there touched the ball with his hands, which means we're going to have a penalty shot coming up now for Czechoslovakia, the team. Of course, that's a penalty. That was a blatant cycloball infraction. I think. All white uniforms and Carl and Oscar Buchholz represent the West German team. They are brothers. You do it, Carl. No, you, I'm afraid. The countries represented here. West Germany, East Germany, Denmark, Switzerland, France, Austria. Here's the penalty shot, and it's blocked nicely. Hot dog. More but like Wiener Schnitzel. Check me out. I'm going to do a bunny hop. ...of the West Germans. But two minutes to go here in this first half. Look at that thing. It's lopsided. Yeah, what are they playing with? A pumpkin? Trying to build their lead. Notice the tremendous balance it takes to ride these cycles. Notice the tremendous stamina it takes to sit through this event, even for a minute. And the shot is wide of the mark, off the right side. Now this court measures four. I feel like the referee should be on a cycle. No way, dude. He should be on a moped. Of a basketball court. 
Czechs on a breakaway now. This is Pospisil on the right. And oh, and the Czechs are blocked by the Germans, just like in 1941. See, Rand? This game's metaphorical. This uh, cloth ball, incidentally, is just a little bit larger than uh, all those... Wow, that corner kick was effective, metaphorically. That uh, little banked railing that runs around is about 15 inches high. Goal! Cyclone goal! Cyclo goal! Gives the West Germans a 2 to nothing lead over the Czechs now. All right, Jay, fast Those forward. Mach schnell. He's not your bike. It's German Moody's Takes now. Years, 10 to 12 years to reach this kind of stature. Because of the balance, a uh, shot is just wide of the mark. Again, the West Germans showing fine defensive maneuvers. That's what the West Germans West do Germans best. Now, the East Germans, they're better at building walls. Well, this highly spirited crowd here wanting the Czechs to come back. The Swiss crowd seems kind of neutral. They've seen a fine comeback so far. The West Germans now with the ball. I get nervous when the Germans go on the attack. I feel like they want more than just cyclo goals. What a play by Pospisil of Czechoslovakia. And it is right. now Due to time four. constraints, we're going to have to fast exactly forward to the final seconds. Nice. This is it for all the cyclo marbles. Czechs are down 5-4. They got a penalty shot with seven seconds left. Let's see if bike riding Vaclav Havel can put the biscuit in the cyclo basket. Go, a penalty shot. This could be it. Swoboda moving in. It's no! blocked by Buckle. Oh, God! And, uh, no! The ball in play? No, it's all Why'd over. they quit? They had four and more Germany seconds left. And the Czechs seem to be Germany. devastated by the loss. By the score of five to four. And good that was pretty Germany. bizarre, yet strangely addictive. I know. Ten minutes of that actually end up having more action than your average New Jersey Devils game. That damn blue line trap is ruining Cyclo Ball. All right, okay. Okay, now it's time for us to peddle out some cheapies. Cheapy for most magical moment, I'm going to say the near check comeback. I'm going to say the terrifying voodoo chop. That's black magic, people. And cheapy for least valuable oiler, that's got to be Miller's wife. She really dropped the ball on that one. I say Cody Carlson. Dude, he wasn't even in the show. Yeah, but how bad was he back in the early 90s? True, true. Actually, I'd like to change my vote. You can do that. All right, that's all the time we have for on this episode. We hope you enjoyed the show, and remember, if a sport involves chopping wood or beating the Germans, we'll be there to make fun of it from the cheap seats. For Jason, I'm Randy. Thanks for watching. See you next time. Ah.